ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks and this is The Leader. Our new Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, has given us a first glimpse of what he's all about as he announced his first mini-budget in the House of Commons. And he has gone big. What he's called his growth plan represents the biggest tax cuts of any budget since 1972. Some of the measures include knocking 1% off the basic rate of income tax from April next year, increasing the level at which home buyers pay stamp duty, axing the national insurance rise, and scrapping the cap on bankers' bonuses. It's a bold step away from the economics of recent Conservative governments who've tried to cut back on borrowing, and the budget announcement itself was met with a sharp drop in the pound to a 37-year low. So what does this budget mean for the UK? And are these choices by the Chancellor likely to boost our economy? Fran Boyt, Executive Director of Research and Campaign Group Positive Money, joins me now to discuss the key elements of this new mini-budget. So Fran, first of all, can you just describe what you think are the most significant elements of this budget? Yeah, so this is really a budget for the 1%. You could call it a banker's budget as the the banker's bonus cap got scrapped. Um, And I think it's really significant because it's coming at a time when prices are continuing to rise for most people and more and more people are struggling. And and obviously it's the people on the lowest incomes that are hit the hardest at the moment, which is why it's so jarring to have a government slash taxes for the wealthiest when more and more people are having to choose between heating and eating. But, you know, this what we heard today isn't anything new. It's a doubling down on this failed economic model that believes trickle down economics works, that we should let the richest, the bankers, the corporations you know, keep as much money, their profits, their bonuses. And, and somehow that will trickle down to the rest of us. You know, it hasn't worked. It doesn't work. And it's not going to work this time. And, and we know how this ends. It will be continued stagnant wages public services in decline, living standards in decline, higher and higher household debt. We're already in a recession. So this coupled with yesterday's announcement could deepen the recession. You know, we have an oversized city of London and and an economy reliant on asset price bubbles. So this could even push us into financial crisis territory. And you mentioned trickle down economics there. Why doesn't trickle down economics work As I said, trickle-down economics relies on this idea that if those with the most money, the 1%, the wealthiest corporations, bankers, have, have more money, more profits, then that somehow will lead to more spending in the economy or more investment from corporations. You know, that can benefit the rest of the economy. But we know that doesn't work. We know that the richest tend to save their money when they get more because they just don't need to spend it. And we know that allowing corporations to keep more and more of their profits also doesn't work. Some research by the Institute for Public Policy and Research, IPPR, showed that increases in corporation tax keeping their profits Profits. So cuts to corporation tax doesn't result in investment. And we have some of the lowest levels of investment in the world in the UK. And, you know, now it's pretty much agreed globally that that trickle down doesn't work. And so it really is a minority of people that kind of believe in this economics. A lot of the measures in this budget, quite conservative measures based around tax cuts. Is that what's needed for the economy as we head into this recession? Well, we would say absolutely not. What we need is something of the opposite. So thinking about policies that can actually level up properly, tackle inequality, regional inequality. And also, you know, we need bigger investment in the green transition. Part of the reason that we're suffering from the international gas price and the inflation we're seeing is because of our over-dependence on fossil fuels and their, their volatile prices. So what we, we should have seen today is a hike in tax on, on energy, oil and gas companies who are, are set to make billions from the current situation. We should have seen further efforts to stop the energy price cap going up at all in October and even potentially implementing a free basic energy scheme with targeted support for low-income households who are bearing the brunt of this crisis and facing a really uncertain winter. 
you know, we should have seen things like public sector workers getting a pay rise. We've had wages stagnant and decline since the Conservatives came to power in 2010, you know, over a decade ago. Things are getting pretty desperate in terms of wages, especially for those lower middle income households. And, you know, we could have seen plans to bring energy companies into public ownership for the longer term challenges we face. So there's obviously, you know, a lot of things we would have liked to have heard today, which would signal that the current Prime Minister and Chancellor are grappling with the scale of the problems we're facing. But instead, what we've seen is is a doubling down on, on the current model and, you know, a model that is unlikely to work and could you know just get make the situation uh, worse. Obviously, the income tax cut and the news that they're now scrapping this national insurance rise, it's surely quite good news for most people, isn't it? Because it sort of means they take home more money. So yes, I mean, um, many households will take home a bit more money from this budget. I think, you know, I've heard the, the figure £100 or so banded around by economists today. But, you know, that's tiny in comparison to what the wealthiest are going to kind of take home from this budget. We're looking at those who earn 300000 or above having taking home more than £10,000 extra. And that's at a time when those who obviously earn more are able to pay a bit more in terms of tax. So this idea that that's somehow going to unleash the economy when, as we've discussed, you know, if you're really rich, you don't really need extra money. So you're much more likely to save it and not do much with it. And I saw a a statistic, I think, from the Resolution Foundation estimating that the bottom 10% of households would gain £11.50, whilst the richest would get 60 times that over the next year. So we can see the priorities from this government. And I think, you know, a lot of people in this country would feel a lot of kind of shame, really, of are we really a country that really wants to make that the priority right now when we're heading, you know, we're already seeing more and more families and household really struggling. And and it's now that we want to give those tax cuts for the wealthiest. Let's take a break now. In part two, Fran explains why there needs to be a rethink about the obsession with growth. Growth does not alleviate poverty, it does not improve living standards, it doesn't help with environmental protection, and it hasn't helped drive up stagnant wages for those on the lowest income. And another way of potentially boosting income to the country is the VAT-free shopping for overseas visitors. Do you think it will encourage them to spend more here? And will that be a significant amount? I mean, I think that spending from tourists is obviously part of our service economy. It's an important part. But I think when we're we're looking at the kind of scale of the challenge, the inflation that's obviously stemming from international fossil fuel and gas prices, when we're looking at the statistics of the millions of people that are really facing insecurity when it when it comes to putting food on the table, it feels like these aren't really meeting the scale of the challenge. And so whilst they're, you know, from the budget we've seen today, there can be you know, small increases in spending here and there from tourists, it doesn't really fit the bill in terms of what we're facing as a country and as a society in terms of inequality, the need to level up and need to tackle um, the green transition and tackle climate change. You sort of touched there on the the energy companies. And uh, we know Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves mentioned earlier today in the Commons, you know, again, this suggestion of using the extra profits from these energy companies to pay for measures that can help people. Why do you think the government hasn't gone down that route? I mean, I think this is where, again, they are a a government that is really fixed on their trickle down economics, you know, relying on boosting corporates, which obviously include energy companies and and the City of London at large to kind of sit on more money and, and that will somehow trickle down to the rest of the economy, you know, it's simply repeating the failures of the past. And obviously, now there's kind of aside from the current Prime Minister and and Chancellor, there's actually wide support for this in the Conservative Party, you know, as we saw Rishi Sunak implemented the windfall tax earlier this year. And so, you know, there is, I guess, a majority in the House of Commons that would support that hike on, on energy companies to go further. And so by actually kind of clinging on to this idea that if we let the energy companies have more money, 
came off their huge nearly 20 billion pound annual profits that will somehow help the energy crisis is you know it's just fantasy economics and and it and it won't work and you mentioned the support within the conservative party for more of a windfall tax do you think that could filter through to Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng when it comes to making decisions going forward? I mean, I guess, you know, what we've what we've had now for a long time, obviously, it's the it's 12 years since the, the Conservative first came to power um, in coalition. But for the last kind of six years is the kind of Conservatives battling each other quite often more than sometimes battling the opposition. And I think, you know, obviously Liz Truss is is weeks into being Prime Minister. So we get to see kind of how this plays out, both in, in terms of political support for herself within the party and whether we we see a kind of a huge amount of energy going into the internal fighting of the Conservative Party again, or whether there's a a more united front than than we're expecting right now. And actually, people get behind her and the Chancellor on this quite obvious plan to kind of boost the City of London, to deregulate the finance sector and to benefit the 1% and, you know, the wealthiest. So, you know, we're obviously in uncertain territory. And obviously, there's a, a general election hanging over our heads, Could one be called next year, depending on how the economy is looking before things get worse? Or will it go to the full term of 2024? There's obviously a huge amount of uncertainty right now. But, you know, Liz Truss isn't doing as poorly as people think in the polls. And so, you know, can she kind of get away with this alongside the Chancellor's budget today? And, you know, we'll have to see how things play out in this what looks to be a difficult winter for many. Probably one of the most telling responses, really, to the mini budget this morning was the fact that the pound sank to a fresh 37 year low. It's not a good sign with people worried about increasing inflation even more. Is this plan within the mini budget for growth likely to address that and potentially boost the pound? Or do you think it's likely to have the opposite effect? Well, I think, you know, what we can see from the international markets is very little confidence in today's budget from the Chancellor. And, you know, again, we're seeing the Bank of England and and Treasury to an extent pulling in in different directions. I mean, we opposed the interest rate hike yesterday because we don't think it's the right time at a time when we have increasing numbers of houses facing insolvency. And we know the main driver of inflation is our over-dependence on fossil fuels, is, is their volatile pricing. And, you know, what we need to see right now is a kind of united front of, you know, facing the challenges of the energy crisis, of inflation, of stagnant and declining wages, declining living standards and public services. And we need the governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, and, and the Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, to be working together. And, you know, at the moment, we're already in recession. It looks like yesterday's interest rate hike and today's budget for the 1% for the bankers are not going to get us anywhere near we need to be in terms of a stable economy that puts the kind of needs of, of households first. So, you know, it, it's not a great outlook for the UK, but again, it, it kind of depends on the speed of things and how things change. And I think the other part of this conversation is this idea that growth is somehow going to benefit people. You know, I think that's something that we've worked on a lot of positive money to dismantle, because actually when you look at GDP growth, in different countries across the world, then there's not evidence that it really does alleviate poverty, that it does increase living standards, or that it does help with environmental protection. In fact, it it often does the opposite. So, you know, with Liz Truss saying that, um, that growth is more important than inequality, we have to ask the question, well, growth for who? And you talk about growth there, Fran, and it does seem that growth has been the sort of ultimate target in economics forever, despite it not always leading to positive outcomes. Do you think it's time for a bit of a shake-up in economics around this idea of growth? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think there's a huge problem in targeting GDP growth. As I said, growth does not alleviate poverty. It does not improve living standards. It doesn't help with environmental protection. And it hasn't helped drive up stagnant wages for those on the lowest incomes in this country. So, 
what we need to be talking about is what matters to us. We did a poll during the pandemic that asked people whether they would prefer the government to focus on growth, GDP growth, or on health and well-being. And, you know, quite overwhelmingly, people said health and well-being because that's what matters more to people. And so by chasing growth, we just totally miss what actually matters in life. And that's what, you know, economics should be doing. And We've been part of the kind of new economics movement, I guess, since the financial crash in 2008, which has challenged the the economic orthodoxy, which says, you know, markets know best, we should chase GDP growth, banking kind of can be unleashed to do what it wants, we don't need to look to kind of hold it to account. And it's been a really slow process, it's slow progress. But you know, we can see much wider conversation happening now than 10 years ago, I think. And that's partly because things have gotten worse and worse and worse. Um, And, you know, from today's announcements, and the kind of global um, uncertainty of, of different shocks to the economic system, then you know, I think we're seeing more and more that our governments and central banks are just out of tools. They're using the um, the models of the past, which are the failures of the past, to try and deal with today's challenges. And I think, you know, the kind of relentless pursuit of growth and, and the growthism discussion is, is really central to that. And we really want to move it away from that and to what really matters, as I said, you know, living standards, health and well-being, education, chasing GDP growth won't improve those things. There's more on the government's mini budget online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. Thanks for listening. We're back on Monday afternoon at four o'clock.